Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Dialogue Over Division and today I have Sean Harasmichuk. Did I get that right? Very, very close. Harasmichuk. Harasmichuk. I should get it right because it sounds like there's some Ukrainian in it. There is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm really uh, pleased to have you on today and just so everyone's aware before we get into it, we're going to talk about a subject called that which we call a carbon tax. And I'm very interested in having this conversation because what I'm about is trying to elevate the conversation and actually having reasonable conversations about these issues we're hearing. And lately, there's been a lot of talk about carbon tax, but I feel like not too, too many people understand what that means and how that would work. So we have Sean here. I'm just going to go with your first name. And if you could give us a little bit of a background and how is it that you know anything about carbon tax to begin with? Sure. Uh, my background uh, academically is mathematics and sociology, which often go hand in hand, right? No, they don't. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I found them both very interesting. And I did computer science and physical sciences as well. Uh, with, with that background, uh, I came from Manitoba to Alberta in 1995, and I worked in oil and gas. I had a pretty good career. I did measurement and controls. So I became very used to um, all the concepts and the, the electronics, but also the concepts behind taking data from the field, pressures, temperatures, flows, etc., and uh, bringing them back to an office environment and all the steps along the way that that data might go through. Um, so a lot of my work was, was centered around data and I also did controls, which is controlling pipelines, truck terminals, gas and oil plants and such. And uh, over the years, I was tasked with uh, helping um, my friend and uh, business partner, Doug Cassidy, the senior piping designer, uh, to help him with some uh, data problems that came up in engineering projects. And so the, this data was related to materials management for construction purposes, pipes, valves, and fittings is the way to think about it. And I developed some software routines to help uh, facilitate the movement of this data more more effectively in, in these projects. Um, uh, we could go into a whole subject about construction projects, engineering projects, and how cost overruns happen, why they happen. But uh, what we're trying to do is reduce those cost overruns by effective data management. Uh, lately, uh, I've taken an interest in uh, that which we call a carbon tax because my visceral reaction to it is that it was wrong. And I set out to prove why it was wrong. So I started out trying to prove why it's right. Or I started out trying to defend it in myself. Mm -hmm. And I repurposed a lot of what I've learned from oil and gas and also the tools that we created in, in our database procedures and database software. Um, trying to repurpose those for research purposes. And so I thought uh, that which we call a carbon tax would be a very good start. For, for, for these tools. I hope that brings me up to today. Yeah, and I actually find the background, it was mathematics and sociology, you said? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I have, um, my undergrad was in science psychology. Mm -hmm. And I find that, and then I went into law, of course. And I find that it it's nice to have that, it's broader as well as narrow. Obviously, I think math is, Mathematics is narrow, sociology is so broad. Same with law, it could be incredibly narrow, but I think it helps to have a bit of a bigger perspective with some of these things. And I think that's why mm -hmm. some people are more apt to tackle these things than others and just stick with either that legal focus or that math focus. So it doesn't surprise me that you have an interesting background like that. Okay, thank you. And so uh, it was from the mathematics background with oil and gas that you've come to discuss this topic a bit more and you've been analyzing this carbon tax issue more. That's right? Well, that's correct. From from an analytical ba um, perspective, yes, with mathematics. But in my view, mathematics isn't just about um, analysis. It's about, and you might appreciate this in in um, in your career as a lawyer, is about making an argument and about saying things precisely mm -hmm. and about having precise definitions and using those precise definitions. Can I 
can I not only learn from the past, but can I make projections about the future? So it's not just about numbers. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm a language phobe, or, or, uh, file, sorry. I love languages. And uh, that comes because I love the mathematics language, if that makes sense. So uh, coming at it from the mathematics background, I saw that there was, uh, there was not a lot of work done to set up the definitions properly to evaluate the scope properly, uh, to um, lay down what measurements of success would be, what are we trying to do, what are we trying to achieve, how do we know we're going to achieve it, what do we do if we don't achieve it, mm -hmm. who is in charge, what are the roles and responsibilities. And when I started discussing all of those things to myself and to my colleagues, I realized that I'm talking about project management, and, uh, and I work a lot with project managers in oil and gas. And a lot of these concepts come from project management. So I widened my scope, Eva, and it's not just from the mathematics background. I would say it's from everything I learned in oil and gas, which which is the wider scope of project management. Um, that that that's that's how I came to it. And like I said, I had a very visceral reaction to to the whole concept, even back in two thousand and nine when Stefan Dion tried to um, promote it mm -hmm. in the House of Commons, and it was it was voted down at the time. I, I couldn't make any sense of it. Um, my first reaction was to think of Cookie Monster from Sesame Street, which I used to watch when I was young in, in the early 70s. And I remember him having four cookies on a plate. And he wanted to have more cookies, so he tried to rearrange the cookies on the plate. But every time he rearranged them, he still only had four cookies. So a lot of people that um, are used to listening to me will hear that the carbon tax is nothing more than rearranging cookies. That's how I see it. Well, that's really interesting that you say that because I just um, posted something given that I've been, you know, challenging people a little, a little bit, not really intentionally sometimes, but then I just see the reactions. And what I've come to appreciate a little bit is I think it comes to what you're saying is what I think we're seeing with some people um, in elected positions, they, they want to show you this pretty picture at the end. But they don't really talk about how they get there or what they're trying to achieve even or how much effort it takes or money, really, resources it takes to get there. So it's really funny, your analogy of the four cookies, because that's what I've been sure everybody wants more cookies. Um, hmm. But is are we actually going to have more cookies? And how much are those cookies going to cost? Like, let's just get the full picture ready, people. It's it's a bit, I could see where your frustration is because I think we're coming at it from different um, different ways. So let's talk about then that the definitions. Let's talk, like, uh, I know you, you gave me some notes here. So let's start with the definition of carbon, if that's sure. okay. Sure. So we, we have shortened our language, I think. It's, um, would you say, colloquial uh, to, to express carbon now instead of carbon dioxide or instead mm. of carbon pollution or instead of carbon management or carbon emissions. We, we say carbon instead of all these things. It would be like saying golf instead of golf ball, golf cart, golf course. We're, we're just shortening our speech all the time. But I think it's dangerous. Uh, we were talking, myself and uh, my business partner, Doug, we were talking to um, a young lady who's an MLA for for uh, a writing in um, Alberta. And when we were talking about carbon and, and all of its various forms and uses, I was surprised that, um, that she, she was very interested in what I had to say. Very, very bright young lady. Um, she grabbed right onto the fact, oh, you mean like, yeah, we're all made of carbon and carbon is in diamonds and carbon is in the earth and carbon is in the seawater. And, Carbon is an, an essential backbone to life. Carbon is what we build life upon, and then we tear it apart again in decay or combustion, and then we build it back up again. So when I saw that in, in this young person, it, it it drove me to write this the way I did, because um, because I think that if we continue to use carbon as a dirty word, I think younger people will learn it that way. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's important to, to, to avoid. Uh, it's, it's just a chemical element. It's, <laughs> that, that's what it is, you know. So it, let, let's talk about that. It, mm -hmm. Is carbon, in your view, a dirty 
element, word, any of the above? Or are you just saying it's an element, it's part of life, and let's just talk about it? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm going to be referencing back to my article here. Um, no, so to me, it's, it's not dirty at all. When I was looking for images for my article uh, for Carbon, I was really surprised. Uh, I was on a website where I could get free royalty-free uh, videos. And all I did was type in carbon. And I've got all sorts of pictures of teachers trying to teach their students all about the negative aspects of carbon and dirty carbon and pollution and everything. But no, it's um, it's not a dirty word at all. I, I did chemistry labs when I was young in university. I never associated poison to anything except maybe for lead and mercury. And, and that association makes sense. Those are poisons to us. Uh, we have to watch what, what kind of contact we come, or what kind of um, ways we come into contact with the, those substances. But carbon, I don't have to watch how I come in contact with it. I'm made of it. My DNA is structured around it. My um, starches and glucoses and proteins and everything else are structured around carbon. Carbon is an ideal backbone. It maybe doesn't have all the properties we need, but it's a really good backbone for all the other things that we need. And, and they sit on top of carbon in, in, in very complex molecular structures. Uh, carbon makes up lipids and fats, it makes up alcohols, it makes up fuels. It, it's, it's everywhere in, in our human experience. And it's certainly not dirty. If it was, um, we would have to avoid ourselves. We'd be made of pollutants. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like that's where we're going. <laughs> Maybe that's the ultimate goal, the biggest conspiracy theory. That's what they uh, say. You, you, you didn't have the word carbon dioxide here, though, because I think maybe that's one that seems to have the, is, you know, found to be dirty. Is that right? Would that be a correct statement or not? Um, that's where, that, that, that's where people are trying to associate it. Yes. To, to being dirty, but it's still not fair. If I could say that it's not accurate or fair. Now, carbon dioxide, uh, is, is, is a product of combustion or it's a product of, um, of metabolism. So every time you work out, every time you breathe out, you're breathing out the results of combustion inside your body and lots of slow combustion metabolism. So carbon dioxide is part of a cycle actually, because carbon dioxide is used for plants, of course. Uh, plants take it back up, and with sunlight, they split the carbon dioxide back into carbon and oxygen. They combine it with water, and they make starches and glucoses, and they give off oxygen and water. And so it, it, it's part of a big cycle. Carbon dioxide, think of it as um, a trucking company. It, it's a carrier. It's a transport system that moves certain um, certain elements one way, in this in this complex cycle of metabolism and uh, decay, um, carbon dioxide. Let me just check my notes here. It's also used for um, for um, <laughs> my uh, for looking after um, food preservation. I'm laughing because in my time in oil and gas, we you, you get accustomed to traveling and, and buying these sandwiches in in gas stations, and a lot of them are puffed right up with um, CO2, and that's mm. a preservative, right? So if it was a pollutant, they wouldn't be putting it in there to preserve the food. It actually does a good job of preserving the food. It keeps the oxygen suppressed so that there's not a lot of work being done by microbials to break the food down. So these sandwiches were known for lasting for way longer than the recommended expiry date. Um, so we, we kind of always had a laugh about that. It's used to make, um, to make uh, drinks fizzy. It's to assist in water purification, prolongs the lifespan of food. It assists in freezing. When I was young, I worked at Burns Meats for a summer, pushing meat in the freezers. And at the end of the day, I helped package it, and we would just throw a bunch of uh, dry ice on it, which was, um, which is just made from carbon dioxide. So, carbon mm -hmm. dioxide itself is certainly not a pollutant, but we can discuss where it might become one. Yeah, yeah I'd like to. I like your analogy with the tr trucking industry that it's uh, a carrier, mm -hmm. and. Um, I, I understand that plants and trees require carbon dioxide. So if trees and plants didn't have carbon dioxide, what would happen? Do you know? Well, they, they just, they couldn't live. No, not at all. 
Um, I often joke that I could take the uh, exhaust from my barbecue, which is piped into my um, gas supply, or just from our uh, gas furnaces, and put that right into a greenhouse because it's got everything plants need, heat, water, and carbon dioxide. So uh, the way I think about the cycle is it's nature's perfect battery. Mm -hmm. If we have... Um, if we have carbon dioxide and water as two um, main ingredients that go into plants, plants need those. They take them up and then they have sunlight, a source of energy. And what they do with that energy is they split apart the, high, the H2O, the water, and they split apart the CO2, the carbon dioxide, and they recombine it to make a complex starch out of, out of uh, C's and H's and a little bit of O's. And, and those make sugars, actually. So sugar is just made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows that, but that's what you learn in biology and chemistry. Those those are the fundamentals for starch and uh, sugar. And, think, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, sorry. And then plants make something called lignin out of that, and that's what uh, is their is the stuff of their. Um, what I understand is it's the stuff of their stalks and their leaves and everything. It's the stuff that makes a plant and um, even a tree. It just It makes lignin out of that. It also makes sap and starch and stores it in the, in the ground. So again, just to recap, plants have taken carbon dioxide and water and with the addition of energy, they've made their food and they've given off oxygen and they've given off water. And when we burn it, it's exactly the opposite. When we, sorry, when I say it, I mean hydrocarbons. So there's a long process of catagenesis, which is when a plant dies, goes into the ground, and slowly decays into um, a carbohydrate and then a hydrocarbon. And yes, hydrocarbons are, are carbohydrates extended, <laughs> if you will. Uh, they're almost the same thing uh, molecularly. And, um, at one point, they, they, they can be the same in catagenesis. Anyway, after so many years, the um, uh, the fuel, we'll call, it, we'll call it a fossil fuel now. Not all uh, hydrocarbons come from fossil fuels, but this is one way to get it. When we get the fossil fuel back, we have carbon and we have hydrogen. So what we do is we burn it, which is combining with oxygen. So we're reversing what a plant did. And we're exactly reversing it. All the light and heat that comes out when we burn is exactly the sunlight that went into it to combine it. And we get back the carbon dioxide and the water. So it's it, it's what you put in is what you get out. Okay, and I think that you did, you earlier said that we could talk up, get into carbon dioxide being a pollutant. So is that what you were just getting at there with the reverse cycle? Uh, no, 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 what I'm getting at there is, no, sorry, that's, um. I, I see that as rearranging the cookies. So okay. we've got carbon dioxide and oxygen and water and energy. So we're just rearranging them. If we add energy, that's a plant and, and it's doing certain things to, to combine them. If we burn them, we're releasing the energy that we got from the sun, but it's mm -hmm. still just rearranging cookies on the plate. And so in one of my articles, I show the actual total mass of carbon, oxygen and hydrogen in the earth and how it moves between all these different substances and in the atmosphere and in the earth. But uh, no, at no, in no sense is it a pollutant at those points. No. There is one point where it is, and if you want, we can talk about that. Well, let, let's, because sure. this is where I, I think lots of people get confused where it gets dirty. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people think even earlier, just carbon dioxide, period, dirty, bad. <laughs> uh, or carbon, even that word. So let's let's get to where it becomes a pollutant and why it's become such a dirty word. For sure. Um, and this is something I discovered as I was doing my research. And it's one of these things where when you have a scientific brain, you're not supposed to throw away any data that you find, even if it's contrary to what you're trying to prove. Mm -hmm. Because science believes in the method, but a non-science brain just believes in the outcome, just wants the outcome. So we trust the method and we trust the method is going to give us the outcome. So the method that I used was I was looking for everything to do with geoscience, to do with carbon and carbon dioxide. And I found um, a great article about the acidification of the oceans. And so when, when ocean water is cold, actually the colder, uh, the more it does this is what I understand. 
carbon dioxide gets absorbed, just like just like oxygen gets absorbed into ocean water, and it it comes directly from the atmosphere. So it'll, it'll soak it up like a sponge, and the carbon dioxide splits apart into ions. And um, when it does that, it creates a slightly acidic environment. And there's a few more processes that. To be honest, I didn't follow down. They were really complicated, but there is a way that that eventually ends up with a pure acid in the uh, atmosphere, or sorry, in the uh, ocean. And they've done measurements over time, and I believe these measurements they're they're from they're from oceanographic um, stations all over the world. I don't see any reason to doubt them or or think that there's any other influences at work here, and they're showing a definite acidification trend over the last 40, 50 years. Um, the numbers may be small to us right now, but they definitely look like something that I would say we should look at. We should we should be concerned about this. I don't know if it's the only source of getting CO2 from the atmosphere. Maybe it's getting CO2 from other places, but the acidification of the ocean is what I would call matches the definition of a pollutant. Like we, cause we, because it does interfere with life. And that's interesting because that's something I don't think we've heard about much at all. No. I'm no. certainly not getting the bad press that carbon is. No. You know, and most of the people that I've ever worked with, if if you showed them that you were hurting the world, they would they would want to shut down right now. They would want to do something about it. And I think that anybody that looks at this evidence should say, well, this is alarming. I'm, to be honest, I'm not alarmed about what they call global warming. I'm not convinced that there's a real trend. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people that aren't. So it's certainly not something that's um, that's settled. And by the way, science is never settled. Yeah. But this is, oh, but this... I know that at a minimum. Yeah. That's the one that has been bothering me the most. It's yeah. like science is constantly changing people. Yeah. That's why there's so many of them and they keep doing more research yeah uh anyway oh so i should say this uh acidification trickles down slowly in the ocean Mm -hmm. and it actually interferes and it's a known mechanism it interferes with the ability of marine life to to take um carbonates out of the water and make their shells and so it's a it's a known system and it's a little progression and i would be alarmed about that i'm I'm just surprised that that's not mentioned yeah but the other things that i've looked at as far as the the trends and the graphs are concerned i'm not alarmed at at all um again that's my initial reaction well um i don't know i i did want to talk about definitions first but i don't know if maybe we should talk uh, about greenhouse effect and or global warming more uh first what Maybe let's just talk about why it is it is that you don't feel um, too concerned about what you've seen in terms of global warming. When in the 1980s, we had a problem with chloro, fluorocarbons, um, CFCs, and they were destroying the ozone layer. Mm-hmm. I remember reading about it in Scientific American when I was in university at the time. And thinking, well, this is shocking. And there was global consensus on this matter. I don't think anybody fought it. It was real. It was known. Um, The system was known. Uh, Ozone is made in our upper atmosphere by sunlight. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to make. But it's very crucial for life on Earth. And from what I understand, one molecule of CFCs, which I believe were in refrigerants mostly, and canned sprays and stuff like that. Uh, one molecule could destroy a thousand molecules of ozone in the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. So, with that consensus at, at that time, I never really thought much of conspiracies or that there was ulterior motives behind anything. That one made sense to me. And they observed the hole over the Atlantic, or the um, sorry, um, Antarctica every year. And uh, the world stepped in to do something about it. I, I think that's a positive, a positive human moment. When I listen to global warming, I'm 
uh, advocates or ch climate change advocates, I'm not hearing the same consensus. Even though they say there is, I don't see it. I see a lot of a lot of um, counterpoints. Uh, I, I don't see a broad consensus at all scientifically on this. I I, I think that they're being alarmist. Uh, I'm not seeing how. I, actually, I, I don't even see how you can take a 40 or 50 year span and and pretend that you know something about what's going on in the world. I just there, there's a lot of reasons why I don't think so, but that's the that's the surface. I I, I have a strong objection to 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 the rhetoric I see around climate change. I, I I'm not believing it myself, not right now. No. Yeah, well, I, I have a hard time following it myself, and I, I, I'm not looking at it at all as closely as you are. And I think that's part of the problem that we have, is that there's just so much information coming at us. And like you said, when you described the ozone issue, and I'm going back to how you talk to about outcome versus the process to the outcome. So it seemed like with the ozone issue, everybody could see and understand how they got there and what was causing it. When we're talking about the global warming issue, I just hear it's like, it's too cold or too hot or it's the Antarctic or it's 30 years or it's a hundred million years. And I'm like, okay, everyone's got a different idea of why this is happening. And so maybe, maybe that's a problem we should be talking about. And it seems like we're you're you're kind of suggesting the same thing as well. I, I sure am, Nova. You know, I, I, I just don't buy it when somebody points to forest fires and says, mm. hey, this is climate change. How can you make that connection? Yeah. I, I just don't know. And so, again, yeah, if you're scientific, you believe in the process. And um, if the process is found to be not right, we go back and we change it. But that's yeah. how we accumulate knowledge in science, isn't it? Whereas if you're not a scientific mind, and unfortunately there's a lot out there, you're going to take the end result and you're going to make it whatever you want. Yeah. And yeah, forest fires. That's another one I completely like omitted. And oh my gosh, there's a forest fire. Climate change is like, what about the Antarctic? What about this? <laughs> anyway, I know, I know. yeah, that's another one. Yeah. You have the words here, greenhouse effect. Can you remind me and everyone else? Sure. sure. There's just so many of these terms that are whirling around in the atmosphere right now. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a good way to put it. Um, I, I didn't really get into that until I did my first paper on Alberta natural gas in 2017. That was my first reaction to the then NDP government's um, attempt to levy a, a carbon surprise on us. And uh, that's when I looked into it in depth. So what I found, it makes sense to me, and it's, it's, it's generally a consensus is that carbon dioxide, it's colorless and odorless, it's a gas, it's a trace gas that exists by nature in our atmosphere. It's um, pretty translucent to the light energy that comes from the sun. So you know that there's the visible light that we see that comes from the sun. There's also light of shorter um, wavelengths and longer wavelengths that we don't see. So our eyes can only see part of the, of the energy spectrum that comes from the sun. All, all or most of that energy passes through and hits the earth and the water and the land um, and, and the oceans and it can and that energy can get absorbed and turned into heat. So we heat up. And then at nighttime when we start cooling down, um, there's a there's a concept in physics called black body radiation, but basically any body that's hot will radiate energy. And so this energy gets radiated back um, through the atmosphere into space, but it has a different quality than sunlight energy. So even though there's energy from the light, from the sun that we cannot see, you've heard of infrared and ultraviolet, for example, there is also energy from the land that we cannot see, but it's a slightly different wavelength than the one that comes from the sun. And when it can, when it hits carbon dioxide molecules, basically not molecules, sorry, uh, carbon molecules, or fluorine, which is the same class of element as chlorine, uh, or sorry, uh, carbon, yeah, as chlorine, yes, that's right. Oh. But uh, but fluorine um, 
and carbon act the same way. When these wavelengths hit those atoms, those atoms actually absorb it. They don't let it pass through. It's just, it's like just the right size is what I understand. So mm -hmm. they absorb it and, and then they get into an excited state. They're hot and then they re-radiate it again and then they cool down. So when they re-radiate it, well, there's a chance that half of it goes into space and half of it comes back to the earth. So depending on how much we have in the atmosphere, we're always re-radiating some of that heat back. And if we look at the planet Venus, that's what it's in. It's in a runaway um, state, I believe, hundreds of degrees Celsius on the surface. Um, and it's not just carbon dioxide, it's other gases as well. But uh, I believe that that's what ha what's happened there. So that's what I know of the, of the greenhouse gas effect. We have very little carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, very little. So I'd be surprised if somebody could actually say that that accounts for any warming that they even think that they see. I'm not even convinced we see warming, but. So greenhouse effect though, that was one of the terms used to suggest that the temperature on earth was getting warmer. But you're saying you haven't seen that evidence. I, well, I, there's two things. There's the measurements that have been proposed since the famous hockey stick. What was that of 1998, 1999? The one that showed all the temperatures going up. Have you heard of that? I don't know if I remember. Oh, okay. Yeah, they call it the hockey stick. It was, um, it's been shown to have been made from slightly skewed data, I believe. I'm re just repeating what I've heard. Um, but anyway, there's been a lot of attempts to just show from measurements that the world is, is heating up. I don't know if any of those have been conclusive or if there's a, a consensus. I'm sure a lot of people are going to write in and say, well, sure, there's a consensus. We hear it all the time, but I don't see a consensus the same way I remember seeing in science at all, that, 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 it, that it's a warming trend. Um, it, it's the same as if you took a population sample of anything, say uh, average heights of people. You're going to get all sorts of, uh, of of different measurements. And just because you get a couple of measurements slightly off, does that mean you're really off? Well, we have standard distributions. You learned that in psychology, um, your, your standard bell curve, right? And what does it take to actually be off the curve? Would it be one standard deviation, two standard deviations, whatever? And what's a standard deviation in terms of our um, temperatures that we're fluctuating year upon year. I don't, I don't know. I haven't gone in to look at it, but whatever they're looking at right now and calling a warming trend seems pretty small to me compared to the average and compared to the standard deviation. So I don't even know if anybody's made a statistical argument. If they have, they're welcome to show it, but I haven't even found that. So that's one side. The other side is people are saying carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will cause a greenhouse gas effect and will warm our atmosphere. And yes, there will be a point at which that's true. There's no way around that. I don't know how much we need to have that though. So I don't know if you can use that in the argument right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we could talk about this for a while, like this whole, the scientific background yeah. and getting a better basis on it. But I think maybe let's turn a little bit now to the tax, unless there's of course, something else you wanted to touch on first um, mm -hmm. to get the lay of the land on the science side oh, of it. Well, we're never going to cover everything, so I'm, what? I'm, happy, I'm happy to talk to you about this. This is great. I no. thought you had all the answers, Sean. Yeah. No, no. Well, actually, you know, you know what my biggest um, uh, thing that I want to say is? I went yes. looking for answers and I didn't find them. Yes. That's, that's what I really want to say. Well, and, and I like that. And this is one thing I try to, I, I say as often as I can is, I think that's where we we seem to get lost in the these conversations and politicians coming up with these grandiose schemes is sometimes we pretend we know everything about something and I come from it I know as this much about something you know about what's going on in the world and I think if we just come at it from that perspective I think we're just going to be more able to find solutions and talk through these things. But if so many people are, especially now politicians, I feel like they have to come with the right answer to these issues. And I'm like, can we just acknowledge that that's probably never going to happen? 
<laughs> Let's have um, these discussions instead. That's, that's why I love your message. And, uh, <laughs> well, thanks. I, I love what you're doing. No, a, a politician is supposed to be a representative and a manager. You're a manager. If you if you need to get something happening, go find the right people to do it. You yeah. Know, is um is our current uh, environment minister somebody who should be speaking on the science of this? matter i don't think so i don't know what his credentials are but it doesn't seem to me that he's up to the task of, of discussing the real science behind this yeah. but as a politician if he went and searched for the right person and and, and or the right people and group of people and, and vetted everything with them and and got and represented them appropriately then th we'd be a lot better off wouldn't we yeah well i think i my view is i don't think he's looking for that and this is why I'm doing what I'm doing is because I think it's on us to start like this is why I love having these conversations and we need to start elevating the conversation. So then we could challenge these elected officials and say, excuse me, Mr. Gibo, why aren't you talking about this? This seems yes. to be a concern. Yeah. Anyway, so we're I think it's I need I think we need to put in a lot more work and so I'm happy to be doing it. So let's talk a little bit now about carbon tax. So yeah. you think this is not the solution? Absolutely not. It's, Should we start uh, with the definition of tax or what you or you had it here as a definition? So I, ha I have a definition. Um, give me one second here. I found it from the Tax Foundation. Oh, and, you're well, well ahead of me. <laughs> and. Uh, and, and yeah, and I did intend to talk about the carbon tax more than anything today. So I will try to get as many points in as we can here. Um, in our common understanding from the tax foundation, yeah, tax is a mandatory payment or charge collected by local, state, and nationwide governments for individuals or businesses to cover. Uh, sorry, from individuals or businesses to cover the costs of general government services, goods, and activities. So these charges that are levied under the plan. The plan is called the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, mm -hmm. with GGPPA. The charges levied under this plan, they're not collected as revenue. And they make that very clear, they're not. They're rearranging cookies on a plate. We'll get to that um, hopefully later, but uh, it's not for revenue and it's not being used for essential services. So, and you're, so you're reading off the definition of the tax and you're saying that's not what it is. That's what that's not what it is. It doesn't do that at all. It doesn't it doesn't meet those two criteria. It's mm -hmm. not revenue for the government and it doesn't pay for anything in the public service. So Interesting. It's not a tax and it's not about carbon. <laughs> so so why are we calling it a carbon tax? Mm -hmm. Seems a little bit suspect. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, in an indirect way, of course, you could say it's about carbon, but Let's stop calling it that because it, you're not taxing carbon. You and I are carbon. So, yeah. yeah. Well, so let's get into it then. Sure. Please. And you have here carbon. What is pollution? Carbon yeah. is not pollution, and arguably CO two is not pollution either, which I think we've talked about. Yeah. But so then, what is it that this uh, greenhouse gas pollution pricing act is suggesting? Who is going to be charged? And how? Right. right. So this act is all about what's going to be charged for, or who's going to be who's going to be charged, what, for, and how much. Mm -hmm. And they've got the right to do it. It's because it's. Um, and I hope I have my legalities right there. If you read that, it's it it's achieved um, legislative law status because it's been assented to, okay. and also case law because it's been agreed to once in the Supreme Court of Canada. So the, the greenhouse gas pollution pricing policy, uh, you know, I, I would rather, I would rather say what the, um, what the um, incentive is behind it for okay. them first. And I'm just trying to find that here. It's, uh, it, it, it's a statement that you will see over and over and over again. Here it is. Putting a price on carbon pollution is widely recognized as the most efficient means to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I'm just going to say one more time. Putting a price on carbon pollution is widely recognized as the most efficient means to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's the basis for this plan. Mm -hmm. So what they want to do is they want to influence the market. They say that 
They want to influence the market and get people to change their consumer behavior. And they're going to do that by artificially adding a surcharge. It's not a tax e either in the sense that it's a percentage base. It's not, it's, it's a surcharge. Um, you pay the same amount of that, which we call a carbon tax on your, on your gasoline, no matter what the price of the gasoline is. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're going to do this thinking that because people generally change their behavior when they, when they experience a change in prices, mm -hmm. that they're going to change their behavior with respect to the consumption of fuel. And then to really confuse things, they add in, but to help people out, we're going to return all of this money back, but it's not going to go back to everybody that spent it. <laughs> it's yeah. going to go back according to some other criteria, which I don't really understand. I think it's income based, but so that's, that's the plan in action. And, um, sounds like they have it all sorted. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, um, let me just, uh, find where, where it is here. I've got so much that, um, I lose, I lose my place and my, my apologies. No so what, what, what we're charged for, there's, there's two ways of charging. One is um, output based is, and from what I understand of this, and I didn't follow output based very much because it's more industrial. I'm worried about the consumer. The and can, can you just remind me and everyone what OPA stands for? Oh, no, output. Sorry. Output. Oh my gosh. Oh, sorry, I was being Out too <laughs> You were thinking OPA like your grandpa. Yeah. Well, I, I thought it was like Oil Association of Canada. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I could make one up. That sounds good. Um, but output, okay. Output, yeah. Output-based, sorry. So for industries, there's an output-based uh, plan, which I'll really um, summarize here. It's just you've got an expected amount of CO2 that you're going to produce with certain activities, like smelting iron, stuff like that. And it's inescapable, you have to do it. So what you're supposed to do is monitor how much CO2 you output versus how much of that activity you've produced. And you can get a credit for coming in under or you pay a penalty for going in over. Mm -hmm. And you can carry those credits and debits for a certain amount of time. Um, didn't explore that one very much. What I did was I looked at the fuel charge for public consumers. So the aim of this thing is to charge you for how much CO2 you're going to emit into the atmosphere. So you're going to burn a hydrocarbon. Like this, this, this has a schedule where it, it, it um, attacks, not sorry, um, where it um, applies to all sorts of fuels. So solid fuels like uh, coal and coke, um, liquid fuels all the way from aviation, gasoline to propane and, um, and natural gases. So for all of those hydrocarbons that we will purchase, there's a known amount using chemistry and mathematics at the beginning per liter or per ton that you buy as a consumer. When you burn that, it will emit this much CO2. Mm -hmm. And right now the charge is being put on how much CO2 you're emitting into the atmosphere. So sometimes it gets confusing. Right now we're at $65 per ton. Let me just check. And on April 1st, it's going up to $80 a ton. When you do the math on octane, you know, your uh, fuel in your car, uh, and I've shown an example of how to do that in the article here, you can compute exactly how much um, carbon dioxide you're going to emit from burning a, a liter of gasoline. So then you can figure out how many liters of gasoline you need to burn to emit 65, sorry, to emit one ton. And you mm -hmm. need to charge $65 for that ton. So then they figure out how much to charge you per liter. I hope that makes sense. It, yes, I, I understand. It doesn't make sense. No. <laughs> okay. I understand the mechanism. It doesn't <laughs> make sense. No, no. Yeah. So, so that's how we're being charged. We're okay. being charged on how much we expect that you're going to put into the atmosphere. You're a consumer and it can only be charged from what I understand from when you buy it with the intent to combust it. So you're not somebody who's buying fuel to stockpile and store somewhere. You yep. get an exemption for that is what I understand. You're using it to burn. 
So you said that this was to influence the market, and it's actually in the legislation that that's the goal and the purpose of it. Yeah. Do you know, did, did they say who came up with this brilliant plan or how they came up with this amazing Well, well there's, there's authors' names on it, um, government officials from when it was ratified, but they didn't say how. No, the only thing is that quote that I gave you. Mm -hmm. Putting a price on carbon pollution is widely recognized as the most efficient means to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So I did a study on that statement. It's it's a small study, but I should have been able to find backup for it. Mm -hmm. I do research yeah. all the time. I, I, I did. A, I put in a reasonable effort, and I wasn't finding anything. So I thought I'm going to get scientific about this. I recorded all my hits on one day. I think it was December 4th uh, last year. And I, I took the first 27 um, Google responses to this search, searching for this term. And Eva, all I found was a circular argument. Like it, it's like every arm of government uses this phrase in much the same way that when you're children, you might say, well, it's okay if, if uh, you can, it, my mom says it's okay if you can sleep over at my house, if it's okay with your mom. And then you go to the other mom and say, it's okay if we sleep over, if it's okay with uh, the other mom. So <laughs> I don't know if I said that right. But anyway, it's circular. It's yeah. uh, if, if it's okay with you, it's okay with you. And the, and a lot of the quotes that I found were, you know, slightly variant in their, in their tone or in their uh, verbiage, but the essence was the same. And the way it speaks to you is you're a moron if you don't know this. Of course we all know this. It's widely recognized as the most efficient means. And so so I came up with a list of things that I wanted to ask about this. Yeah. And here they are. Putting a price. Well, how? By who? I, and I think you're starting to ask that now. Yeah. On carbon pollution. Well, by what definition of pollution? I have a definition of pollution from the environment uh, arm of our government. Yeah, and it doesn't match. Like this is not a pollutant. As a matter of fact, I understand that they had to change the definition of pollutant in one in one piece of legislature so that it matched what they're doing here. Is widely recognized. Well, that 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 statement. As soon as you encounter that, what that is is a psychological attack on you, right? Well, everybody agrees, as everybody knows, this is a great yeah. movie. Everybody loves this, right? So then you've got the fear of missing out. So widely recognized, I don't say by who, I don't see anybody yeah. as the most efficient means. Well, when you say the most efficient means, that means you had a way of measuring. So what's your measuring? What's your measure stick? Was it inches? Was it happiness? Was it about a hundred? Like, like what, what were the less efficient means that were studied? So yeah. the most efficient means, what were the other means? Yeah. And if you go through a bid spread in project management, you've got a procedure that you have to follow and you, and you have to honor all of the bids that you get back. I look at this as a bid. Like if, if there were a bunch of means that were submitted as, Hey, this is how we should tackle greenhouse gases and climate change. Well, it's incumbent upon you to list them all and to tell us why you decided on this one being the most efficient. So. Well, I want to say, Minister Gibo, it looks like we're on to you. And those are excellent questions people could be asking their elected representatives. What were the other means? How was this one the best? What was the measurement? Um, and this is where we need to start having these conversations. And it's particularly troubling. Like, that's what I, you know, it's hard to hear that you're a moron if you don't know, but that is the message we keep getting. And I think that that's not inaccurate. It's we've dumbed down the conversations. We're not even having these conversations. And that's, I think, um, where, where we really need to step up. So I'm really glad you went through that all. And one really important point that we haven't talked about yet is Canada's contribution <laughs> to this yeah. whole... I don't know what it is, global warming, carbon dioxide, uh, climate change, whatever the right word is, but or just plain old, good old plain pollution. Uh, maybe that's the right word. 
But what is Canada's contribution and what would you use as the term? And do we know if this Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, is it going to change anything? It's, those are great questions. Um, there was nothing put forward in the execution of this act to come back and even circle back and ask these questions or to evaluate measures of success or failure. Nothing. Not that I've seen. So, how um, how do we know what Canada's contribution is? My easiest way is I, could, I took the 40 years of data from 1980 to 2020. I added up all the reported carbon dioxide emissions in Canada, mm -hmm. and all the reported carbon dioxide emissions in the world, and we're at 1.9% for those 40 years. So that doesn't mean we're 1.9% every year. I think that with the emerging economies, especially in the green, in the, in the uh, third world, we're going to see our contribution even less because they're burning more fuel. So 1.9%, well, in the GGPPA, what does it say about how much we got to knock the world down by, you know, to uh, to achieve our goals? Mm -hmm. well, wait a minute, what are our goals? But anyway, if we had a goal, how much would we have to knock our um, carbon dioxide emissions down by? Doesn't say. But is 1.9% going to do it? I don't need to be a mathematician to say yeah. it's not going to make a hill of beans a difference. Now, I did do a study on um, the historical basis for this plan in Alberta. Uh -huh. What I wanted to do was show, put your studies aside, put your modeling aside, look at real life. What happened during the uh, COVID shutdown? What happened during the global economic meltdown mm -hmm. in 2008? And uh, what happened just when prices changed? So if you're saying putting a price on carbon pollution is widely recognized as the most efficient means to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, well, I can show you that in Alberta for residential and commercial users, there was no correlation between their spending habits on natural gas and the price. Mm -hmm. and the price in those years went from $1 and change to $9 and change. Mm -hmm. There was wow. no correlation. And when I say no correlation, I mean visually, but also analytically mm -hmm. using, using correlation studies. There was a strong correlation to temperature, which is not surprising to us. The colder yeah, you the, use the, the more <laughs> carbon you use. Yeah, <laughs> the more we and use. It gets cold. Yeah. So if you so when I look at that, just being a scientist and being a little bit um, blunt, I would say, well, if you want to control people's behavior, you have to control the temperature. You're not going to control it by controlling the price because yeah. history shows that it didn't change, not at all. Yeah, what we do see, probably you'll see a scale of complaining. The prices went up. You, there's probably a high correlation to that. <laughs> but they'll still buy. If you need to get somewhere and if you need to heat your home, you're going to do that. Like, You've, Well, and I've got a list of critiques here too. Yes. Uh, you probably saw those. Um, I can just mention them quick if you want. Yes, and, and I think we've kind of gone through them, but I think that's a, it's very, it's a good idea to go through them again. Yes. Sure. Um, the lack of historical studies of real price versus um, the use fluctuations is alarming to me. I don't understand why we're looking at modeling scenarios. And believe me, the modeling I looked at, it was all very vague and descriptive. I couldn't find one database that I could download and look at myself out of all of these hits. But to not look at history and, and try and explain what happened in history first, well, that's the first step in science. Why well, so, so let's just pause because that's the one I don't think we talked about too much mm -hmm. is what, what kind of historical studies did you look at and what would be helpful to have looked at for the government? Sure. Well, j the one that I just mentioned was my prime example, actually. So historical natural gas use in Alberta, yeah. I found a strong correlation to temperature and okay. no correlation to price. Mm -hmm. So why not start with something like that? It's it's dead easy. You've got all the data right there. I downloaded the data. I I put it into graphs. I was able to analyze it, I, but I don't understand why it's lacking in the GGPPA. Mm -hmm. Well, all science, as you know, starts with looking at real phenomenon that we can observe with our physical senses. Mm -hmm. And we ask questions about it. Why is this happening? Well, let's look at the history and see why it's happening. So, mm -hmm. hope that does that answer? 
one? Yeah, and if you have another one handy. Um, uh, no, I know what I would do, but I, t I took that one because it was easy for me to do because I understood yeah. gas being in the industry. And, yeah. um, and um, it was, yeah, it, it was just quite easy for me to do. So, uh, sorry, I wish I could do another historical study. It would take a lot more work. It would be very intensive. Yeah, no, no, no. I was just curious. And then fluctuation, that was all based on modeling is that if the price increased, that was what they were saying. Well, their their modeling is very suspect. I mean, I wish I could get my hands on it and see what they're actually doing, um, but I can't really see what they're doing. Their their modeling is is more along the lines of, here's how much we've burned in the last five years. Here's how much we would have burned if we didn't have a pricing policy, and it's backwards to me. I don't know how you mm -hmm. can do that. Okay, you're making a lot of assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Frictional drag. Yeah, what's that one? So, you can't get out of a system what you put into it. And and um, I think a lot of us are getting very tired of hearing that most people get back more than what they put into this. It's, again, back to Cookie Monster. You can rearrange the cookies as many times as you want. You're not going to get back out of it what you want to, what you put into it. So, let's take a look at your car, for example. You're driving mm -hmm. along on the highway. Let's say you want to regenerate some electricity. So you hook up a generator on a on a trailer and you pull this generator behind your car. So now you're making electricity, right? And now you say, hey, wait a minute, why don't I just feed the electricity back into my car to drive it? Well, that's free energy, right? Perpetual motion. But it mm -hmm. doesn't work. There's there's frictional drag, there's overhead losses on every system. You can't get back out of a system what you put into it. So the carbon levy on our economy is like putting the brakes on our economy. It, it's like they're saying, here, I'm going to take something out of the economy, the surcharge, mm. but I'm going to put it back in. But we know from physics, and I'm sure it applies in economics as well, you can't get out of a system what you put into it. And, and, and that concept is elementary to, mm -hmm. to, to, to most professionals. I, I don't understand how anybody is selling it on the idea that people are getting more than what they're putting into it. Mm -hmm. Do you hear that too from the rhetoric? Yeah, a little bit less, but definitely I, I see, I think I've heard it in a different way, but yes, very, very similar. So the, the carbon levy is functionally like you driving with the brakes on all the time. Mm -hmm. It's just creating heat. It's, it's a waste. The government role influencing markets and changing behaviors is that really their role i i don't know but somebody should ask i i don't i don't have a very good reaction to the idea that somebody wants to come along and just tinker with prices and play with prices to 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 uh to, to cause an effect that they they wish to see well and i just add tinker with the prices on things that are so fundamental, like heating yourself in minus 50 or 40 or 30 or 20, even anything, and getting yourself to work. Like, that's why people have cars, too, or to have a social life. Do you want, you know, how much tinkering on those very fundamental aspects could, can there be? But I, I just had point. that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, do they have the right to tinker with anything? But yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is a fundamental. Um, who pays? Now, I found that there's a lot of coal that we're um, taking out of the ground here in Canada and selling to other countries, the USA, uh, China, and maybe India as well, though they produce a lot. And nobody's paying the carbon levy at that point of sale. Mm -hmm. And it's about a third of uh, the coal that we produced over those 40 years. Interesting. Yeah. So unless we're stockpiling it uh, somewhere, I think a lot of that coal left. And I don't know if there's any ability even to find out if somebody paid a carbon levy on it. Um, has it worked? Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, right. Has it worked? The metrics. How do we know it's worked? Um, that's a hard question. And that has to be thought about by a lot of scientifically minded people. Mm -hmm. As I sit here right now, I can't come up with a very, very good idea or good answer on on how to measure if a pricing policy worked, because you need a control uh, population, right? You need a population where you have it and one that you don't. So yeah. 
very and, and what it, what is the goal what is it that we're trying to make work <laughs> what are we trying to do you know and and if we're measuring the atmosphere and we reduce if even if we reduced by 10 percent, so 1.7 of the world instead of 1.9 percent yeah. of the world and a 10 percent reduction to us would be catastrophic for many of us even if we reduce it that much who's to say that there's going to be a burp somewhere else in the world that's going to just replace that. It's you're yeah. never going to be able to tell by measuring the world how we're doing in Canada. You can mm -hmm. only tell how the world is doing. So I don't know. I, I don't know if anybody has thought about the metrics. Um, what difference will it make? We talked about that. What alternatives do people have? Now that's really insidious because for most things that we buy, we have a choice. You don't like one kind of tuna, you can buy another kind of tuna. Mm -hmm. But I only have one thermostat and one furnace. Mm -hmm. I don't have the ability to choose. Should I use electric or should I use gas or should I use buffalo chips? You know, like I just, I, I don't have that choice. And uh, the one that's really grievous to me is the compound effect. Okay. And I've heard that the uh, Auditor General has actually stated that the carbon levy has had an, uh, an effect on the GST, sorry, on the in inflation, right? So can we break that one down a little bit? Sure. So you're going to pay an extra price for fuel. Mm -hmm. And you're going to pay it when you buy it. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're a small business and you need to charge enough to pay for your expenses. You're not going to wait for a rebate. And besides, you don't even know how much you're going to get for a rebate because the formula doesn't make any sense. It's not going back to the people who paid. It's going back to people based on a different formula. So you have to charge more. When you charge more, your GST goes up because uh, it's the it's the final tally. Mm -hmm. And I understand that a lot of our um, utilities are charging GST on top of the carbon levy. So this compound effect, and that's just that's just one step. Let, let's suppose that whoever you're selling your goods and services to returns and does it again to somebody else and to somebody else and to somebody else. There has to be a way to study this large compound effect of um, how much we're increasing, especially our GST. Basically, any taxes that we're adding on to the end of the bill. Mm -hmm. Because we've just increased our bill. Right? Yeah. Well, and, and I'm glad you mentioned small businesses because I find that that's one that they always get the short end of the stick, really. Um, throughout the COVID pandemic, it was like, everybody uh, take care of yourselves, watch out, but small businesses, you close and you'll figure out your issues financially. With this same thing, carbon taxes, like here's small businesses around Canada trying to employ people, provide local services, um, stimulate the economy in a different way. And then no attention, I find, is paid on the effect on small businesses. We talk about the end user a lot, but not very often on small businesses at all. And that's so important. It's it's what we're all, we're all living off small businesses. Yeah. Here. The, to see the ones that were crushed during the, the lockdowns was heartbreaking yeah. to me. You know, there's there's some um, another critique that I have that I only thought of after I wrote this for you, mm -hmm. and I thought about it as I was preparing, is that this lack of of planning and preparedness on the government's end that goes into something like this act puts us in a confrontational relationship because it's up to us to do what we're doing right now. We're evaluating it, we're critiquing it. Sure, it's easy to critique after the fact, but I don't think much work has been done on this thing. I don't think um, a reasonable effort has been put in to see what its impacts are. How do they put the brakes on it? How do they change it? How do, how do they feed back from, from, from the public into, into the execution of this plan? And are they relying on us just to take the government to court over and over again? And as we are, is that not a confrontational role for us? Like, like, shouldn't we be doing a better job before the legislation is passed? 
Yeah, well, I'm with you 110% on that. And this is where I've been very critical of the mainstream media in the last few years, because I believe that that's their goal is to challenge the government. And although some will say we are, they I don't see it. I don't see it at all, especially with conversations like this. Mm -hmm. Um, And yes, it becomes incumbent on us to do so. But this is the other thing that's frustrating is for you, you saw that and you were probably like, there's so many holes in this legislation, but somebody like me, I, you know, this is not one that I have very much knowledge about. There's other ones that I scratch my head at right away, but you need somebody to speak up and, and kind of explain it to others. And then, you know, then there could be more of an effort to question and examine these things. But I agree with you. And I don't think that's the role of the government, but this is or to be in a confrontational um, situation all the time. But that's what it's become, unfortunately. We've seen that a a lot in the last few years. I think even Mm -hmm. um, within the government, you know, once they've shut down things and we're doing it via uh, online instead of in person, I think that there was even uh, it it became difficult for people to critique it on opposition as well, from what I understand. But it, it I don't think this is the way that it's meant to be passed. I'm with you on that. Yeah, and I don't think that we could have planned for this. You know, the people that wrote our constitution or Mm -hmm. the policies, I think we were expecting a certain level of character and a certain certain, um, decorum, a certain way of playing. But to throw stuff out there, like an act like this, and expect people to deal with it, it's beyond comprehension. Um, I don't understand... A lot of it, but I, I think I understand enough to be critical. Mm-hmm. Um, and if a guy like me can't find the necessary information online, but I can find I can find the act okay, I can find all sorts of things okay, but I can't find the substance behind this policy. I can't find the 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 methodology, the criteria. I can't find reasonable studies that have been done. That's very disturbing. I should have been able to find that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think that because we're not getting it, I think this is where we really need to come in and start. I I comfortably use the word demand answers from our elected officials because I think that's a role. If we're not getting that, that the, these answers and this information from them, we should be demanding these answers at this point. So I... Uh, I'm I'm very comfortable with that word. One thing I I do want to wrap up only because we're just over an hour now and I try to keep them nice and tight. And I think we've actually covered a lot of ground. I've learned a lot and that was very helpful. But one thing I heard somebody say in um, when they were discussing global warming, carbon, uh, climate change, all these things is the argument that I heard that was the best um, against all of the alarmist alarmism is large multi-billion dollar or million dollar um, homes are being built on the water and insurance companies are insuring them and we I think everybody knows enough about insurance that the first thing they're going to do is a risk benefit analysis and they're not going to be insuring homes that are going to be wiped away um, by water in five or ten years So that was when I was like, that's such a practical and common sense response. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to worry so much about the carbon, carbon, carbon issues and uh, climate change right now, because I know that the insurance companies would have made that assessment 110%. So is that, do you, do you agree with that? Well, let's put it this way. I I took the first actuarial exam and just barely passed it. And I needed three years of university mathematics just to study for that exam. Oh, and wow. Act- and actuaries are the ones behind all this. So yeah, I got a lot of trust in them for yeah. sure. Cause I got a lot of trust in the method for sure. Um, no, I, 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 I would agree. You know, I, I think that it's just, it's become a religion and a lot of people's personalities are wrapped up in it. And uh, if you attack the, the carbon, that the climate change thing, you attack the personality and they get really defensive. Um, I'm just surprised, Eva, that, you know, I, I'm obviously very skeptical about 
climate change, and yet I'm responding when I see about the oceanic um, uh, acidification. How could I ignore that? And yeah. I'm just shocked that somebody isn't bringing that more to the surface. Is it happening from raw sewage? Is it happening from something else being dumped in the ocean? I don't know, but let's be let's be concerned about something tangible, not something will of the wisp like climate change. Well, Sean, you're not yelling loud enough. <laughs> I'm tired of yelling. <laughs> yeah, no, well, this is this is what I've been saying. Like, I think name one person on this planet that wants the planet to be, you know, a spitball of fire. I think you will not find anybody. So the ultimate goal, everyone has the same. We want to live in, you know, humane conditions. But let's analyze it. Let's make sure we're doing it the right way. Let's make sure we're getting the right metrics in place and getting the right outcomes instead of just yelling about it. And that's what I'm so just tired about. So this was such a great conversation, Sean. I'm very happy we had it. Just reasonable discussion about these issues. And hopefully we've encouraged some people to maybe start asking questions of others and especially their elected officials. So if there's anything else, maybe we'll wrap it up there. And um, you're on LinkedIn. Is that where people can find you and anywhere else? Yeah, on LinkedIn, uh, the company is Point Verge. Um, that's where we have our data tools and analysis. Um, that's where I publish these articles. Um, I'd also like to say that if anybody wants to see the research that I've done, I have it in nice interactive Power BI reports. You're welcome to yourself. I can help get you set up with that. And you can just click and see what um, what kind of use we had from 1980 to 1988, if you want, or something like that. Um, anyway, the, the, the tools that I've made for, for this effort are available for everybody. You can see my research. So um, I don't know how anybody would reach out to me besides LinkedIn, but, but if anybody does mention that to you, please pass it on to me and, and uh, I'd be happy to set them up with, with, with what I've got. Perfect. Well, I'll put your information and your the company um, in link to um, the podcast. But okay. that was great. And uh, thanks for reminding me about where people, the more information you have, the more you could read about this. Just inform yourself, empower yourself, and then you're more comfortable in these discussions. So thank you so much, Sean. That was great. And I will hold you for a few more minutes on uh, for the paid X subscribers that I have. So we'll just end here. And sure. thank you all. Um, and thank you very much, Sean, for that great discussion. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure.